Society Library. My name is Betty Sargent, and I have the great pleasure of being on the board of this wonderful institution. So, tonight, you all know who's with us, um, and I am very pleased to have the honor of introducing Mr. Winchester. And I'd like to tell you very briefly can, you, can everybody hear yes. about what happened to me at lunch today? I belong, I'm an editor by trade, and I belong to a group of publishing people who we'll have lunch together once a month. <clears throat> so I was at my lunch today, sitting next to a distinguished literary agent named John Silverstack. And I told him I was excited about tonight, and Simon Winchester was going to be with us, and, and how thrilling this was for everybody. And he said, well, you know, you know the Larry Ashmead story, don't you? And I said, no. Larry Ashmead was a distinguished editor in New York City, a very dear friend of mine, and of Simon Winchester's. In 1998, Larry was in London at his biannual <clears throat> trip to England to see if there's anything over there that those English people were publishing that we should know about. And on the back of one publisher's desk was a book proposal. And it had an odd title, and Larry was very interested in odd things. And so he said, well, let me just, the, sorry, but the editor, I'm sorry, the publisher was about to toss it out. Nobody was interested. This is too bizarre. We, we don't care about this. So Larry said, well, can I just take this with me back to New York and take a look at it, and I'll be in touch with you. So he read this bizarre manuscript on the airplane. He got to New York. He coupled up Simon, and he said, I'm going to publish your book. And that book was The Professor and the Man. Oh, wow. Isn't that a great story? Mm -hmm. So we are very honored to have with us tonight Simon Winchester, who's going to talk to us about his new book on skulls, a whole different subject. This is a man who is a magical storyteller, a brilliant researcher, and we are really honored to have him here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That is extremely generous of you. Thank you. Um, this is very much a departure for me. I've never written a book like it. And one of the odd things that's happened as a consequence is that people keep coming up and giving me things to, <laughs> to identify. And this happened to me the other, about two weeks ago in, in Portland, in Oregon. And a woman had an enormous shopping bag. And she came up and said, can I show you this? And would you help identify it for me? And it was. I mean, it was spilling out of the shopping bag. It was an enormous skull with great horny things. And I said, well, it's fairly obvious what it is. It's an elk. And she was enormously relieved and went away. <laughs> um, but that allowed me to, to tell in Portland a story that I had long forgotten. And the story doesn't have a great deal to do with skulls. It's a tiny bit to do with skulls. But it's so. Um, broke the ice with the audience that I've actually told it once or twice since. And although, if you'll excuse me, it doesn't have a great deal. It's got a lot to do with elk, but very little to do with skulls. Um, I hope you'll indulge me in allowing you to tell me. It was a rather bizarre story. It happened. I was living in New York at the time. This was 1980, May. And I got a telephone call from a newspaper in England saying, would I go immediately to Washington State um, and specifically to Mount St. Helens? To, and it was the 14th of May, if you remember Mount St. Helens exploded on the 18th of May. And um, we want you to interview this chap called Harry Truman, who you may possibly remember, not Harry S. Truman, but Harry R. Truman, who was the curator and had since 1927 been the curator of the Spirit Lake Lodge at the very summit of the mountain, and who refused point blank to leave the mountain. Dixie Lee Ray, who was the governor of Washington State at the time, had declared a total exclusion zone that was clearly the mountain was just about to explode. And the only person remaining on the mountain was this cantankerous old gentleman, Harry Truman, who lived there with 16 cats and seemed to us, in England anyway, to have the makings of a rather good story. So knowing that we were forbidden from going there, I nonetheless thought, well, you know, we're English and don't understand the niceties of American law. I'm sure we can manage to talk our way out of it. So we flew to Portland and rented a car from Hertz, drove north up to Longview, turned right, and began ascending the mountain, which was smoking and bubbling and looking fairly ominous. 
We came after about four miles to a barrier across the road which said it is illegal to go any further. But both to the left and the right of the barrier, you could see sort of vague pathways through the woods. So I turned, I think, to the right and went with this Hertz car through the woods uh, and eventually got up back onto the, the asphalt again, now up above this barrier, and continued up the road. And then we came to a much more formidable barrier, barbed wire and a skull and crossbow. So it is actually a skull dimension to this story, um, saying it is dangerous, you're not allowed to go, enormous fines will be imposed on you, you'll go to prison, um, you mustn't go any further. But we knew Harry Truman was on the other side somewhere, so we were determined to go. It was impossible to go to the right of the barrier, but through the left, you could vaguely see a sort of track through the road. So. The photographer climbed over the fence and the barbed wire and landed on the other side. And this car, you know, actually, the irresponsible thing to say about it, it didn't belong to, you know, it belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Hertz, so I thought, <laughs> what the heck? And I, I gunned it down through a sort of a ditch and then up the other side, and it progressed for about maybe 10 feet before a terrible bang, and it stuck itself, the sump, firmly on a, a stump that I hadn't seen. Projecting from the ground, and I could neither reverse nor go forward. So I was, if I can use an anglicism which I'm sure you're familiar with, I, I was, I was well and truly buggered. So I got out of the car, I left it, I joined the photographer on the road, and we walked up. And it was extremely unpleasant because it was just like walking up on the deck of a ship because the road was, it was an enormous amount of motion underneath the. Uh, volcano and there was steam gushing out of fumaroles on either side. It was a sort of Dantean view. But we walked up this road and got to the Spirit Lake Lodge and there was Harry Truman and there were his cats. And so we took lots of photographs of him and interviewed him and how he was defiant about how he'd never leave. He was born on the mountain. He was going to die on the mountain. Of course, he did precisely that four days later. Um, so we got what we needed. We turned around after half an hour and really wanted just to get back to some semblance of safety and walked back down the road and came to the barrier on the other side of which was a police car with its lights flashing and a very tall, very large officer who clearly had had a major sense of humour failure and <laughs> said, um, what do you think you're doing here? And we said, we're from England, as if that's any kind of excuse. Uh, and he said, well, I don't care where you're from, but you're not supposed to be here, and basically, you're under arrest. And first of all, I assume this is your car, and we've got to get it back on the road and get it out of here. And um, so what I'm going to do, whether you like it or not, is call a tow truck from Longview. He will not wish to come up here, but I will order him to do so. He will charge at least a thousand dollars in cash, so I hope you've got some cash on you. Sure enough, so over half an hour or so later, up comes this chap who, with consummate ease, lifts the car off the uh, tree stump and plonks it on the road and then takes a thousand dollars in cash for, for doing so. And then the policeman explains what's going to happen. He says, I am going to go first, and in my car, and you are going to follow. You are under arrest, and we will go to the station in Longview. You will be booked, arraigned, you will go to the court, and then we'll see whether you're going to spend the night in jail. But basically, you're in big trouble. So we followed him down, down the, the road, and we came eventually to the second barrier, which had been the first one. And of course, he had a padlock key, and he unlocked it, and we swept through, and he locked it up again, and we continued down for about another mile, when suddenly he slammed on his brakes and got out of the car with a rifle. And we thought, well, comes any trespassing. <laughs> you know, America has got strange sort of attitudes towards this kind of thing. But he said, no, no, don't worry. He said, look, I've just seen over in the woods to my right, and it's out of season, but I've just seen a lot of elk. And basically, I'd like to shoot one of them. <laughs> and, but the trouble is, that it's impossible, as well as unseemly, to put a dead elk on the top of a police car because of that big gantry of, of lights. So the deal is this. If I succeed in getting an elk, I would like to put it on top of your car, and then we'll think again about the charges that I've <laughs> So we sat in the car listening to the radio, and then five or ten minutes later there was a crump of an explosion, and he 
came running and beckoned to us. And I've never touched an elk in my life before, but we were hauling this dead beast. <laughs> Then up on the top of our car, and he had some string, he put his legs to the windows, and we tied it all together. And so we progressed, and we didn't go to the police station at all, we went to his house, and uh, his wife gave us a cup of tea, we unloaded the elk in the garage, and he said uh, all, all charges have been dismissed. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with skulls, but um, I, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so tell you, and I blessed the woman that brought the, the skull to me in Portland. So on to, on to skulls specifically. This all began um, about three years ago when I got a telephone call uh, from a friend of mine uh, called Max Whitby in London who has a company that makes apps. Actually, the name of the company is at the top left there, Touch Press. And he's done a lot of remarkable apps, a clever chap. And he said, I want you to read today's Daily Mail. Now, the Daily Mail, as I'm sure you all know, is the most popular online newspaper in the English-speaking world. It is hugely and wantonly irresponsible. It's frequently deeply inaccurate. It's a typical English tabloid newspaper kind of thing that was excoriated by the, the Leveson Inquiry that was reported just last week. But it had a story in it, the details of which I'll tell you in a moment, about a man called Alan Dudley who had a remarkable collection of skulls. And Max said to me, this chap is so extraordinary, I think we ought to do an app on him. So I read a bit more about him and, and went over to London a couple of days later. And he lives in Coventry, which is an extremely dull industrial city in the English Midlands. And he lives in a very ordinary <coughs> suburban street there. And he is, uh, it never ceases to amaze me, uh, the jobs that people have. He, for the last 30 years, has had as his full-time employment, he selects the veneers which go on the dashboards of Jaguar motor cars. <laughs> so if you buy a Jaguar and sort of admire the walnut or whatever it is, Alan Dudley, who was 57, I think, would have selected it. During the evening, however, he has, and for the last 30 odd years, he has been collecting skulls. And I asked him immediately how it all started, and he said that, like all English schoolboys, he collected newts and tadpoles and frog spawn and that sort of stuff. And he also watched religiously the, the wildlife programs of David Attenborough, which you can see over here in this country. And so he was interested in a typical sort of young boy way with wildlife. And he was walking home one day, he was about 18 at the time, and he saw beside the road a body of a red fox, which had clearly been killed in a traffic accident. And he thought to himself, I wouldn't mind stuffing this, uh, learning the craft of taxidermy, and this is a beautiful thing. But he picked it up, and he noticed that it, you know, many of its ribs were broken, and, and a big gash in its side obviously been hit by a motor car or something. So he thought that that taxidermy probably wouldn't work. But then he made the decision which separates Alan Dudley from what I suspect is most of us in this room. He said, well, in that case, I'll cut its head off and um, try and prepare its skull. In this talk, there isn't too much which is disgusting and it's having a couple of subjects, but, but the next couple of minutes, you might find a little kind of offensive. He, he took this head of this fox and with his pen knife, he cut away the fur and then the muscles underneath and he reached in its mouth and cut out its tongue and the eyes and so forth, and eventually scraped it. And I'm going to have to be doing a lot of this this evening, so I hope you won't mind me, because I want to show you what came up as a result. Um, in fact, if, if you can hear me, I might do a bit of this from here. Yeah. You can, can you good? All right, well, this um, is what he came up with. Mm. That was his first ever skull, and as you can see, um, after all the grotesqueries of uh, taking off the fur and stuff, um, it is a really rather beautiful thing. And I'm not, this isn't going to be a very technical talk at all, but I will briefly describe the, the main parts of a skull. It has this habit of rotating a lot, but I'll try and do it. Yes, well, anyway, you can probably whether it rotates or not, it doesn't really matter. The big part on the top it is the cranium, as I'm sure you all know. The you know, principal job is to house the brain, that's the brain case. 
This is the eye sockets, of course. This is the lower part of the mandible. So there are essentially two parts to a skull, made basically of about 26 bones. These things are the zygomatic arches. In a human being, there are cheeks. Um, the auditory bullae, if it's very big, if it's an animal that has a, a need to hear very uh, acutely, like in a, a hair, for instance, a very large auditory bullae. And this thing here is, is the sagittal ridge, which, um, to which the muscles are attached, which open and close the, the mandible. So if you've got a big sagittal ridge, it's likely that your mandible bites down onto the tigers, for instance, they're very big sagittal ridges. And the front part, um, I know you probably can't see it over here, but the front part is, is known as the rostrum, and it's basically where the, the nose or the, uh, the beak or the bill or the horns are, or in our case, human case, uh, the rostrum is essentially the face. So that is a basic skull, and as you can see, um, a very beautiful thing. And so Alan thought, well, this is terrific. I'll, um, I'll try and collect one or two more of these. And so he, his next thing was a newt. Um, and this is his first newt, which, as you can see, is, is very different. It's a very different kind of mandible. It's still got the eye sockets. The zygomatic arches are a different shape. has virtually no brain case, because a newt isn't exactly the brainiest animal in creation. <laughs> um, but different and not unattractive. Then, tremendously attractive, was this, which he got, which is um, a firefish, a broad by firefish, which some nice aquarium owner gave to him. And this, I think, was the moment when he decided that he would start making a sort of systematic uh, collection of, of, of skulls. And um, I should say something about the way he prepared them. The first one, as I told you, he, um, he scraped away the flesh, and he did that again with the the newt as well, obviously a slightly different procedure, no fur, more gelatinous and scaly and unpleasant. Then he, as he started to build up his collection, he talked to other skull collectors and found that the thing to do was to immerse them in large numbers of maggots. And maggots just eat away all the soft flesh. But the problem with maggots is, and a kind of beetle called a domestic beetle, which does the same sort of job, is that when confronted with an enormous amount of free meat, as it were, they go completely berserk with a sort of feeding frenzy. And they, if they had elbows, they'd be elbowing each other out of the way <laughs> to get at the flesh. And the problem with that is that when you've got an animal with very delicate bones, I and mean, this clearly has, although they're actually cartilage, not bones, but with a, something that has got very fine filigree bones in its nose, they will break them. And so, um, Alan had to come up with another means, and he went to what may say seem the most uh, primitive of all kinds of, of, of cleaning of, a, of a, a skull, but that's called cold water maceration, where you simply put the skull in a bucket of cold water and leave it there for six or eight months. And the bacteria in the water or that land on the surface of the water, they do a much more gently the job that the maggots would do. But the downside of this is that the water goes jet black and begins to smell absolutely terrible. So um, it was at this point, he was now about 28 years old and had about 70 skulls. But now he had lots of buckets of black, very smelly water um, dotted around the house. And it was at this moment uh, that his wife decided to leave him. <laughs> so poor Alan is now, has 70 skulls, lots of buckets, and she took the children as well, living alone in this rather dreary house, in this rather dreary city. Well, it did, he thought, give him one advantage, so it freed up a bedroom. <laughs> so he decided he would turn this bedroom into his collecting room, and this is what it looks like now. And this is Alan Dudley's bedroom, dominated by an enormous hippopotamus skull in the middle, and a few examples of his taxidermy, but basically hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of skulls. There's the door through which Mrs. Dudley used to come and go. <laughs> Um, so this is his collection room, and it is an extraordinary collection. Um, there are tens of millions of species and creatures on this planet. Um, 
58,000 only, however, are classed as chordates and therefore have a backbone and most likely a skull. And they're divided into five classes, the, the mammals, the birds, the fishes, the amphibians, and the reptiles. And Alan has pretty well covered all of those five classes. Hundreds of mammals. If he's weak in any area, it's amphibians, but lots and lots of good reptiles, thousands of birds, thousands of fishes. And this is a collection that is world class. I mean, it's, uh, he gets his um, animals principally nowadays from zoos. Occasionally he deals with other collectors. But basically, if, as in this case, if I can find the fellow, um, a zoo keeper will say, you know, we've got a hippopotamus who's feeling rather unwell. Um, <laughs> when finally it pops its claws, as we say back home, uh, would you come and cut its head off and then put it in a bucket, or obviously in a big bucket, and after a few months or years, it'll turn into this, an absolutely magnificent specimen of a, of a hippopotamus. So it is a collection which is, it is almost certainly the largest collection in private hands anywhere in the world. But he got him into trouble. And this is why there was this story in the Daily Mail. Um, because in, on, I think it was the 4th of March, uh, 2008, he was um, just about getting out of bed, as he tells it, for another exciting day of veneer selecting. And um, there was a hammering on the front door. And he went down, and there were four policemen there. There was a, an officer from the Customs and Excise Department. There was a chap from the Wildlife Protection Service who had come all the way down from Edinburgh in Scotland. And there were two uniformed officers, um, unarmed, of course, this being Britain, but who were there <laughs> as muscle in case the situation <laughs> got ugly. But, I mean, Alan was the gentlest, nicest, I and mean, he's a classic nerd. There was no chance at all that he was, again, it was going to turn violent or anything. So uh, he said, what do you want? And they said, well, we have reason to believe, having looked at the internet, that you've probably got some skulls that we think you ought not to have. So I'm afraid you've got to stay in the kitchen, and we're going to go upstairs and look at your skull collection in your former wife's bedroom, and go through it painstakingly, and um, decide you know, whether everything that you have is what you should have. And at the end of the day, they came down and said, well, I'm really sorry, Mr. Dudley, but the fact of the matter is you've got five specimens that you shouldn't have. You've got a loggerhead turtle, You've got a particular type of penguin, you've got something called a Goldie's Marmoset, you've got a chimpanzee, and you've got a tiger. And all five of these animals um, you're forbidden from trading in under the Convention for the International Trafficking in Endangered Species. So I'm afraid you're under arrest, at least. We're going to have to uh, charge you, and um, you're going to have to go to court and explain yourself. So um, what happened to Alan it was sort of bizarre. First of all, they made him actually took a photograph of it. Uh, I found it quite easily, I think. Um, they made him wear one of these. This is actually Alan's <laughs> foot um, with a hole in his sock, I see. Um, <laughs> an ankle bracelet, which was finely calibrated to do two things. They, um, they put crime scene tape over the front door of his wife's bedroom. Uh, and it was calibrated such that he couldn't go in there. He'd go to his own bedroom, which was very close, but if he went under the crime scene tape, all sorts of alarms would go off. And the other thing was he couldn't leave the city of Coventry, which is something that I think most people probably rather would like to do. <laughs> <laughs> so not being able to, to go to Coventry, having no wife, buckets of smelling water, and not being able to look at your collection. Life for Alan was somewhat purgatory. And it was at this stage that I went over to see him to talk to him about the idea of doing this app. And um, he was a bit morose, but he said, you can come upstairs and you, Simon, can go under the crime scene tape and you can hand me skulls and ask what they are and, and things, uh, but I can't go under it. And that was the situation that obtained for about four months until he actually came to trial. And then um, the judge gave him a fairly severe wigging because Apparently, the, um, the loggerhead turtle, I think it was. Um, no, 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 it was the, well, I forget which one it was. I think it was the loggerhead turtle. Um, had shown, I think there were bullet holes in it that showed that it had been hunted 
But the one he had bought of three on the internet wasn't in any way damaged, but that was no excuse. He just simply shouldn't have had the beasts at all. He pleaded guilty. The judge said, you know, simply overzealous, you're clearly not a, a component type figure. And um, so he confiscated the five offending skulls. He told them not to do it again, fined him, I think, two and a half thousand pounds, and um, sentenced him to prison for two years, but suspended the sentence for two years. So providing he didn't do anything wicked, he was free to go. And that was the situation when we decided to do this, this app. And briefly, I'll show you the, the collection, which is the dominant part of this, of this app. Um, we chose about three or 400 of the skulls. And um, in every case, you can go to something like the barn owl, there is the barn owl, and there is the skull. And you can um, double click on the thing, and you can expand it or contract it. And you can view it in 3D, left to right, and do all sorts of magical and amusing things with it. Um, and there are lots and lots of, of, of skulls and all sorts of creatures, catfish, toads, condors. Rather amusingly, I don't know if this will work, they, if I go to a human skull, uh, I find a human skull, there's a human skull. As you notice, on the left, they put the species example. <coughs> And on the right, the skull. But when they did the human, uh, when they chose the, there's the species. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's probably because there was more of my skull uh, readily visible um, than for, for most people. But anyway, the reason I think that they got me involved in this was not so much to write about the, the collection. There's a lot of very good and serious biological information if you click on the collection and if you look on the book as a collection, but they wanted to know how the skull fitted into human society. Generally, how do we regard skulls? Why do we have this fascination with skulls? I mean, even if you go back to grave sites five, six thousand years old, the skull is always in a, a, a position of great reverence. And one might ask, it may sound rather glib and trivial to ask it, why, for instance, the pelvis through which birth occurs isn't revered, why the rib cage houses the heart and the lungs, why not the longest bone in the body, the femur, something like that. Why always the skull? Well, it's, it's fairly obvious, even before people knew actually what the brain that it is designed to protect, what it did, there was a sort of a general consensus view that it housed the personality, the spirit of the person who owned the skull. Plus the skull had the orifices through which one can see and smell and taste and speak and so on and so forth and hear. So clearly it was very, very important and it has been regarded in history as the most important part of a former human body. And so what I did in this was to look at certain specific aspects of human society and behavior which involves skulls. What, with your indulgence, I'll do tonight is just to choose four of these areas and explore them in a tiny bit more detail. And I want to begin, and I think for most of this I'm going to stand here, so I hope that's all right with everybody in terms of hearing things. I'm going to have to play with this machine a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, there is one of those. This is for people asking questions, is it? No, that's for you. Oh, it's for me. <laughs> so, the skull in art. Well, the skull. As you'll be aware of, if you're not aware, you'll see it readily, has been for a long time uh, the subject of, of artists. Leonardo there, uh, Dura on the right, um, marvelous agate skull, I think that's from China, this somewhat bizarre anti smoking ad by Van Gogh. This beautiful turquoise skull with um, malachite and obsidian and uh, eyes made of pyrites. Worn as a, as a mask, I think it has taken ages, I'm not sure. But what I want to concentrate on tonight is this extraordinary painting, which I'm sure you will be familiar with, um, by Hans Holbein. And um, it's called The Ambassadors, and it was painted in, I think, 1538. And uh, it depicts two people who were both ambassadors from France. The chap on the left who actually commissioned the painting as a man called Jean de Danteville, 
And the chap on his right, or on the right of the painting, is his friend Georges de Selve. They're both, despite their mature appearance, only in their 20s. I think de Danteville is the younger of the two. He's 25. Uh, Georges de Selve is 29. And um, de Danteville was the French ambassador to London at the time, or to the court of St. James. De Selve was the French ambassador to Venice. And Holbein painted them at a specific time of enormous turmoil in the religious world. And he wanted, maybe he was asked by de Danteville to do this, to depict this turmoil with a variety of beautifully executed symbols, just by de Danteville's left hand. You can see a sort of cylindrical object, which if you blew it up, you'd see shows, it's sort of astrolabe, and it shows the date on which that this depicts, which is the 4th of April, 1533, I think it's 1533, Good Friday, 1533, which immediately invests it with some religious significance. It's also just a few days after uh, Henry VIII uh, divorced or attempted to divorce Anne Boleyn, in incurring the wrath of the Pope, Clement VII, I think it was, and um, beginning the schism which created the Church of England when England or the English monarchy broke with Rome. And so all of the symbols between the two ambassadors um, have some resonance with that uh, turmoil. The globe, for instance, has, if you look at it carefully, Rome at its centre. Uh, the open book, however, is a text written by Martin Luther, the architect of Protestantism. The lute has a broken string, a sort of symbolic um, indication of turmoil or something that needs to be repaired. So I want to go through all of these things and show the underlying feature of this picture is turmoil. It is incidentally an enormous picture. It's bigger than it is there. It's seven foot by seven foot. It's at the National Gallery in London. It's oil on oak. And it's a thing of great beauty, wonderfully detailed. But the most peculiar aspect of it, the cleverest aspect in a way, is that strange smear across the lower third of it from the bottom left to the, the middle right. And that, de Danteville said, as many wealthy and aristocratic people who commissioned portraits in that time said to the artist, that however rich and distinguished I am, I want you, Mr. Painter, to include something in this painting as a memento mori, a reminder that in the end we die. So de Danteville said to Holbein, somewhere in this picture, which is going to be full of alter, other kinds of symbolism, you must put in a memento mori. And so Holbein did, as was instructed, in this clever, clever device, which initially just looks like a smear. Now I'm sure you all know from school what it actually is. But the, while I'm here, I suppose, theoretically, to suggest that you buy the book, the app allows you to display exactly what this <coughs> does. And um, I'll show you, if I can. So basically, this app, we've written this rather clever sort of calculation, which shows that if you look at that, it's called an anamorphosis. It's the same kind of technique that is used on television broadcasts of football games. Something distorted is broadcast in a way that when you look at it from a certain angle, it becomes instantly recognizable. Just like this turns from being a meaningless sort of smear into a really a lovely and beautifully executed, sometimes gets a bit wild, skull. And the way that this was um, suspended was at the top of a spiral staircase such that as you went up to it, you could see a skull, then as you got closer, it became this um, smear, and then when you passed it again, you could look down on it, and the, the skull would be evident once again. So having this app will at least prevent you doing what an awful lot of people at the National Gallery do, which is get down on their hands and knees, and sort of <laughs> zoom in elegantly up past them and say, yeah, that's what it's all about. So this is what it's all about, just at a finger stroke. 
So that was one aspect of the skull that I thought you might find interesting. Another I look at in there are two examples in this particular chapter in the whole field of, of science and pseudo. Sorry, I seem to be at the forefront of all of these things. Um, scientific interest in the skull really began at the beginning of the last century, the, the, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And it was occasionally put to very bad use indeed. I mean, there was this American. Uh, a eugenicist called Morton, I think, who did a very detailed series of calculations of measurements of thousands of skulls which the US Army had collected in Leavenworth in Kansas after one of the more savage periods of Indian Wars. And Morton and a number of other like-minded people at the time measured them, the, the science of craniometry of the measurement of the skull, very, very fine measurements and comparisons. and. He came up with the idea, or others came up with the idea at the same time, that skulls could be classified broadly into two types, dolichocephalic or brachycephalic. Uh, dolichocephalic tend to be sort of rather long, aquiline, nosed, slender skulls. A greyhound has a dolichocephalic skull, whereas a, a bulldog, for instance, has a much squatter kind of uh, uh, brachycephalic skull. But the trouble was, although this measurement was absolutely fine, fine and dandy, Morton and people like him uh, adopted it, uh, created a hierarchy out of it, and said such things as people with dolichocephalic skulls are clearly intellectually or morally superior to those with brachycephalic skulls. And I regret to say this, but this was seized upon in the Third Reich. Jews clearly have, compared to Aryans, <coughs> less well formed skulls, black people similarly. And so, Two sets of extremely unpleasant people seized on this research, said craniometry offers an answer <coughs> for theories of racial superiority, and all sorts of dreadful things eventuated. So there are many instances where the scientific attitude of the skull was put to very bad ends indeed. Not the case here with phrenology, which is probably the most famous, I suppose, but also the most ludicrous. Um, it was initiated by these uh, two Germans in the middle of the, uh, the 19th century who came up with a not unreasonable view, uh, one that's confirmed today by modern uh, neurology, that the brain in certain areas uh, is adapted for certain intellectual purposes. So a mathematical ability might be your left frontal lobe. If you're a great Lothario, it might be somewhere towards the back of your, of the right side of your brain. If you're a painter, it might be left side or whatever. The Germans identified 39 areas of things like amativeness and vitiveness, the love of life. Where they went slightly wrong was that they said, uh, if you have a particular propensity for, let's say, seducing people, then the part of your brain that is the heart of the your seductive appetite will grow, it will bulge. And that's a reasonable thing to say, I suppose. But what is unreasonable is to then suppose that that bulge is transmitted through the skull and to, into a lump on the outside of your head. And that if you, a man or a person with delicate fingers, could very gently uh, feel your surface of your head, he would come up in a few moments with the notion that your proclivities in some area, your moral standing or whatever, was such and such. Well, it is complete balderdash. And if I can give you one rather sad example <coughs> which illustrates this, uh, the brain, uh, or rather the skull, is a very, very solid piece of kit. Not in a baby, of course, but in an adult. It's simply, it'll crack, as you know all too well, um, but it won't expand thanks to pressure from the brain within. There was an awful case in Britain five or six years ago when um, six young students um, agreed to take part in a drug test of a, a new substance being um, peddled by a German pharmaceutical company. They were paid £1,000 each, I think. And they, all six of them suffered what's called a cytokine storm, which is a massive, massive allergic reaction.
And they, within moments, their heads, their shoulders, chests expanded vastly, their faces and went three and four times the normal size. They looked like cauliflowers. And their shoulders were vast, and of course they were terribly, terribly ill. They all lived, I'm happy to say, being given um, antihistamines in very large quantities. But the crucial thing is that they suffered, they looked, people said, like the elephant man. Um, but the reason they suffered such terrible pain is that their brains tried to expand but couldn't expand because the skull is so immobile, it simply will not allow any expansion of the brain within. And if it tries, as with meningitis, uh, you get very, very severe uh, pains. So the science was nonsense. However, it didn't stop this man, Lorenzo Fowler, from setting up shop in Fleet Street, just odd enough beside where the offices of the Daily Mail were for many years. <laughs> sort of an appropriate sort of kinship going on there. And he, they, he, he published a book and um, sold half a million copies. And um, young women mainly would come to his consulting rooms and paid two guineas each to have him run his fingers over their, through their hair and over their heads to discover, for instance, I don't know if you can see this, but just above the left eye calculation, and I don't know, if, yes, people are doing it. People try to pretend they're really scratching their heads, but in fact, a number of people in all audiences I've spoken to feel the tops of their left eyes just to see whether they might be with a calculation, well, really don't bother because this is a total pseudoscience, it's complete nonsense. And although Mr. Fowler made himself a great deal of money, he was fairly soon uh, run out of town by the efforts of one man who uh, was famous, uh, a medical doctor, famous for a completely different set of reasons, and that's Peter Mark Roger of Roger's Thesaurus, who wrote a paper in 1895 or so, denouncing the nonsensical pseudoscience that people like Fowler were making at large amounts of money from, and essentially forcing him to close his, uh, his uh, practice down and, and be derided as a charlatan. And Fowler had there, or rather, Roger had there, <coughs> the last laugh, because if you look in Roger's Thesaurus today, you'll see that um, phrenology is listed along with palmistry and astrology as being just one of those pieces of pseudo-scientific craziness that uh, most sensible people don't believe in. So that's one scientific area that amused me, but there was another, which will probably be equally familiar to you, but it's maybe worth reminding you of the salient details of it, and that's, if I can find this chap, come on, come on, come on, there he is. Yes, exactly, built down now. Looks uncannily like Hitler, it's very strange, but uh, <laughs> this is not Hitler. Oh, incidentally, I, I should say one thing, going back to art for a second. Um, you may wonder why possibly the most famous uh, piece of skull art isn't in this, and that is Damien Hirst's skull, I wish it was Damien Hirst's skull, but a skull that uh, <laughs> called the love of God. It, it, was, it was made about eight years ago after he had done the shark and the sheep and all these things. His mother said to him, oh Damien, for the love of God, what are you going to do next? And he said, I've just bought in an antique shop the skull of a young man, probably from the early 18th century, probably from Marseille or some northern Mediterranean port. Um, which allows me to talk about the, very briefly about uh, the occasional problems of, of buying a skull in an antique shop, very famous story of a man that went into an antique shop in London, let's say, and saw this magnificent skull, which the dealer said it was the skull of, let us say, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but let's say uh, William IV, King William IV, the one just before Victoria, and of course, enormously awed by this and it was for sale and eventually they agreed on a price of several thousand pounds and he bought it and he walked out with the skull of King William IV, delighted. But just as he was leaving the shop, he noticed a very similar looking skull on, on a plinth to the right of the door and said idly to the shopkeeper, 
uh, what was that? And he said, oh, that's William IV as well, but that's when, when he was a baby. <laughs> um, the, um, the Damien Hirst thing, as you probably know, for, love, for the love of God, um, he took this skull, he put a platinum, thin platinum coating on it, and then studded into it eight and a half thousand diamonds, including one beautiful pink diamond over the, uh, the, the center of the forehead. And he then said, this is the most expensive piece of art in the world, and I'm going to sell it at auction for 57 million pounds. Well, no one bought it effectively, and he had to form a consortium and buy it back himself for 35 million pounds, and it now goes around the world in a variety of exhibitions. Well, to take these photographs is extremely complicated. It involves putting them on a turntable, rotating them, stopping them every half degree, so that's 720 times, and taking a lot of high definition photographs, which then allow you to rotate it and expand it and contract it as you wish. We got permission from Damien Hirst to do this. Armed guards, it was a real performance. The photographs, I mean, as you can see from this, they're very high definition, beautiful photographs. But when he, Damien, saw the photograph that we had taken, he complained that it wasn't sparkly enough. So the photography is done by a chap called Nick Mann in Chicago, and he and his team arranged an algorithm which would add sparkle to each of the diamonds, and by hand made every diamond just a tiny bit more sparkly, so that when we saw it, it looked like the most amazing firework display you've ever seen. But still, Damien said, no, it's still not sparkly enough. Plus, he also, I think, didn't much care for the essay I had written about him, which was slightly less sort of a hagiography than I think he normally <laughs> accustomed to. And so he argued and argued and argued, and in the end, we said, well, we're just not going to include it. So to anyone who's expecting Damien Hurst's For the Love of God, I regret it is not in this app. However, this chap is, and I think he's actually a great deal more interesting, um, basically, the story of Piltdown Man revolves around an extremely ambitious, a very pompous Sussex lawyer called Charles Dawson, who, um, very, very full of himself, he, he was an amateur archaeologist and a very successful lawyer who dressed, you can see from his official portraits, he wears a tricorn hat and velvet knee breeches and a sword and not stirrups, what do you call those things, spurs, and um, not the kind of thing that would induce you to go to him as a lawyer, I imagine. But, still, um, but he also was fascinated by archaeology, and so he, would, he was walking one day in 1908, and there was a quarry, and they were digging stone for some new houses, and he went walking and found a number of fragments of a cranium. And he instantly thought these are rather odd, because they appear to be of an adult, but of an adult with a very small brain case, smaller than the brain case of a modern human. So perhaps, just perhaps, this is a very, very early skull. The, the gravels in this quarry were Pleistocene, so what, 975,000 years. So this could be important. He went up to London, to the British Museum, where the head of the geology department, a figure of towering rectitude called Arthur Smith Woodward, when he saw these, he said, well, this is extremely important. Let me come down with you to the quarry and pilt down, and we will search together. Well, over the next two years, they searched and they found a nearly complete cranium. They found a jawbone, this jawbone here, bits of a jawbone anyway, which had all the characteristics of an ape, and found teeth which showed a much more sophisticated omnivorous diet than apes were known to eat. So putting these three things together, the cranium, the fragments, the mandible, and the teeth, Arthur Woodward, who was, as I say, a, a figure of enormous, respected all around the world, a man totally humorless, he and absolutely devoted to work, he had 42 years in the British Museum, took only half a day off and that, in the entire time, and that was because he broke his arm. Um, he stood up in 1912 to make the announcement that everyone in, Britain, everyone in the paleontological world was awaiting that 
he had discovered the missing link. You will remember 1859, Darwin on the origin of species showed that, or suggested that humankind probably descended from, or is in some way associated with, the ape. Teilhard de Chardin had found Peking man. Evidence was accruing that mankind had indeed descended from the ape, but there had been, at this juncture, nothing found that was sufficiently half ape, half man, to suggest it was the missing link. It was missing, and it caused paleontologists great frustration. Well, this, said Arthur Woodward, was it. And the crowning glory of this discovery, which, which he named Eoanthropus, Dawsoni, after Dawson, the man who had found it, was that the missing link to everyone's delight, and this was at the height of the British Empire, the missing link was an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> Not just an Englishman, a Sussex gentleman, like Charles Dawson. So it was given pride of place at the British Museum from 1912 onwards, and here it was, that this extraordinary creature, proof positive that Darwin was right, and that it was an Englishman that proved him to be so. <laughs> well, that was the case until the 1950s. And during those 40 intervening years, other evidence had come to light which suggested that this perhaps wasn't quite what it was supposed to be. Most notably, it was well known that bones that, are, that lie in earth absorb an awful amount, a lot of the chemical fluorine and that when these bones, the British Museum allowed it to be examined, were, were tested, hardly any fluorine at all. And then they discovered on further examination that in fact the skull was probably about 50,000 years old. It was primitive, probably from Germany. The jawbone was that of an orangutan, which had come from Sarawak. It had been painted with potassium bichromate to turn it the sort of orangey yellow that made it look antique. And the two molar teeth that had been discovered under the microscope, little fragments of metal, um, suggesting that it had been filed down with, a, with, with a, a file. So the whole thing was an elaborate hoax on the British Museum and indeed on the entire archaeological world. But the question was, who had perpetrated it? A number of people initially thought it was Arthur Conan Doyle, who lived nearby and had a sort of puckish sense of humor about these things. For Various reasons. Some people said it was Tyler de Chardin himself who had possibly reasons. But in the end, uh, uh, no one thought it was Arthur Woodward, who was a completely respectable chap. But then uh, they looked at Charles Dawson's papers and in his house. They both died by this time. Huge memorial to, to Charles uh, Dawson's distinctive, distinguished work. And they found in Dawson's collections that he had been devoted an entire lifetime to making fake objects of one kind or another. He had, there was a Chinese bronze urn, which was neither Chinese nor bronze. There was a, uh, a whale, an elephant's tusk, um, some kind of instrument which had been cut with a metal band saw. So uh, he, he was a fake. He was, if you like, the, the Jason Blair of the, of the paleontological world. And although they never took the memorial down, the British Museum decided to take this fellow and take him off out of the private place and put him in a back storeroom, never to be seen again, or at least only with great difficulty. And that is the story of Piltdown Man. And I want to finish this up with one other fellow, which I've got time. Well, time. time yes. Good, Tony. Totally um, this is a story um, of a chap I came to know quite, quite well. Um, Another disagreeable and ugly fellow, and I can go back actually to the to the front, I think, for a moment, and just leave you to gaze at this person. It's called Kara Mustafa Pasha, and he's he's a dissolute, unpleasant man. He, the reason you can't see the left hand side of his face is that he fell in a fire during a drunken orgy and burned most of his face. Um, he was the Ottoman Grand Vizier, the general, if you like who superintended an army of 300,000 Ottomans, 20,000 Janissaries, who in the 1680s besieged the city of Vienna. As you remember, the Ottomans had this intention of sweeping across Europe and ultimately getting to Rome. <coughs> Vienna was one of the cities en route. They decided to lay siege to it. The courageous Viennese held them off for the better part of a year. 
And there is there are two sort of rather nice little gastronomic side notes to this story. I'm sure you know well, but it's quite amusing uh, to, to remind them. If you can imagine the, these 300,000 soldiers led by this man were at the bottom of the walls. Inside uh, Vienna, people getting hungry, desperate, frustrated. Um, the bakers had very little flour to work with, but they were on this particular day um, making bread supplies for the, um, for the people within. And they heard underneath the ovens a sound which to them suggested that these wretched Turks were trying to tunnel under the walls. So they told the soldiers, the sentries up top, and the sentries looked over the walls and indeed saw the backsides of lots of Turks scrabbling away like moles and did whatever they used to do, boiling oil or whatever. Anyway, the Turks fled and the tunneling stopped. And the next day, or a day or so later, the combined armies of the, of the Poles and the Swedes, who were the allies with the, the Viennese, swept in and relieved the siege. So the siege was over, and the Ottomans in, in full uh, retreat down towards Istanbul. And the authorities decided, in gratitude to the bakers, to allow them to make henceforward a ceremonial bread roll in the shape of the Islamic crescent, the Turkish crescent, to show that they had vanquished them. And uh, that was, of course, the croissant. So if you go to your breakfast tomorrow morning, have a croissant, do remember the right? <laughs> cappuccino to the memory of the noble uh, bakers of, of Vienna who saved the day. So what happened was the, the, the Turks fled south eastwards and stopped briefly in Budapest, which was a city they had all, already captured. And it was at that point, and somewhat expectedly, um, Kara Mustafa Pasha was greeted by a delegation from Istanbul, from the, uh, the, the, the Sultan, Mehmet IV, who said, as is usual in these circumstances, well, I'm afraid you've lost a battle, um, so I'm afraid you've got to die. But you have this privilege of being allowed to choose the way you would die. And he said, you know, could he? Um, they would like to be strangled. And they said, well, that's fine, we'll get the court strangler. And they did have one, both the Chinese and the Turks had court stranglers, and they brought one up from Istanbul. And the way they did it was with a string from a longbow, so he detached the string and wrap it around the stuff his neck. And you, with some skill and determination, you tighten it and loosen it and tighten it and loosen it. And you can keep a chap alive for half an hour or so forth, which is what apparently happened in his case. Before finally he died, they cut his head off and they sent the head down to um, Istanbul for Mehmed IV to accept that it was indeed Karim Mustafa Pasha. And then they returned the head to the body, buried both together in Budapest, and then moved off back as an army down to Istanbul. That was how it would have remained, except that a couple of years later, the pursuing Viennese, the Austro Hungarians, swept down and took Budapest, which of course you. And you've got to look at the architecture, <coughs> St. Stephen's Cathedral, their influence has been great in Budapest ever since, and sent the, the, the Turks uh, running away. And one of the things they did was that they found the grave of their nemesis. And they decided to dig up the head. They said, you can have the body, take it back and bury it in Turkey. But we Viennese, we'd like the head. And so they took the, the, the skull of Karl Mustafa back to Vienna and put it on display in the museum, the Stadt Museum. In Vienna, and there it has been essentially ever since. Well, I, at least that's what I thought. In 1999, I covered the invasion of Kosovo and decided I wanted to write a short book about the Balkans, and the way I would do it was to take a long, sort of sinuous journey from the two polar ends, if you like, of the, uh, of the conflict, Vienna and Istanbul. And I knew about the, the head and the body, I knew the head was in. Austria and the body was in Turkey, so I thought I'd like to see both as a sort of piece of rather crude literary symbolism, if you like. So I wrote to the director of the Stadt Museum in Vienna and said, Can I come and see the head of Karl Mustafa Pasha? And he said, No, I'm afraid you can't. And I said, Why not? He said, Well, in 1972, the Turks had a big uh, upsurge of nationalist feeling, and they did two things. They went, first of all, to the Japanese and said, we Turks think it is outrageous that you have your brothels, known as generally Turkish baths. You know, a man was feeling the mood for a brothel. He would look for a sign saying Turku. And we want that expunged. And the Japanese um, 
acceded to the request. And indeed, now, I'm sure none of you would ever wish to visit such an institution, but just in case, they're now known as Soparanda Soapland. So what was a Turkish bath <laughs> is now Soapland. And if, if you want to believe that that's where you go for washing, well, leave it as you will. <laughs> anyway, it's much more anodyne. So the Turkish name is stricken from that, uh, from the water trade in Japan. They all then, having succeeded in Japan, they then went to the Austrian government and the Viennese and said, we would like the head of Cairo Mustafa Pasha back, because we think it's an outrage that the head of a Turkish national was just gawked over by tourists in Vienna. And the director of the Stadt Museum said, well, you can't have him back, but we will take him off display. So we'll put him in the basement. And that's as much of a concession as we're willing to make. So when I wrote, they said, no, you can't see it. It hasn't been seen since 1972. But, said the director, you can perhaps come here and make your case. And so it was just like an Oxford tutorial. I went down to Vienna, went to this book line to study in the Stadt Museum, and there was this Tweedy chap with a pipe. And I had to sit there making a sort of intellectual case for why I should be allowed to see the head of this long dead um, Grand Vizier. But it seemed to work. It was after about half an hour of my spluttering and making complete nonsense, I'm sure. He did this wonderful thing. He pressed a button on his desk, and the secretary came in, and he said, Fräulein, would you take this distinguished gentleman downstairs to meet our other distinguished gentleman? <laughs> and I was a great man. I was taken down to the basement. And there was an enormous cardboard box among the tins of paint and things with written on the side, Herr K. Mustafa. And an assistant undid the cellar tape and lifted out this vitrine. And there inside it was the skull of this man with a little bit of hair on the top of it, let me guess, um, four or five rotten old looking teeth, and miraculously, the bowstring still wrapped around his neck. So he and I sort of communed, as it were, for a little while, and then I uh, took off and went and looked for the body uh, six months later. And that's the other little gastronomic note, because his body isn't actually in Istanbul, it's in um, a town called Girasun which used to be a Roman fort town called Caressus, which is the town where the first cherry trees were grown. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to go to some bake shop tomorrow morning and have croissant with cherry jam, <laughs> you'll have the entire history of the Balkans on your breakfast. So I just want to, oh, and I should say as a footnote to that, when we were arranging the photographs for this app and, and the book, uh, we wanted to know where, if we could come and take a photograph, I mean, uh, probably have to go through the same procedure as in 1999, of Cairo Mustafa, and they said, no, you can't, because your book created such a fuss when it was published in 2000, and people came from all over the place to look at this fellow again and ask to come and see the cardboard box, that in about 2004, whoever was the director there, decided simply to get rid of it. So one rainy night, he apparently took it to a cemetery that he, he's now dead, where it was never disposed, put it in a pauper's grave. It is somewhere in the soil of Austria that no one will ever know where Karim Mustafa Pasha is. And I want to say one final thing, which has nothing to do with Karim Mustafa Pasha, which is, goes back to Alan Dudley. I asked him, on one time I saw him, if his collection, if his fire, his house was ever consumed by fire, what one skull would he set save? And he decided he would save that. A two-headed cow, as it were, a, a Siamese cow or a, a conjoined cow. Um, and he got it from a farmer and put it in a very big bucket and let lots of bacteria work on it. But of all the skulls he's got, some of them the most exquisite, and tigers and penguins and marmosets and so forth, this is what he treasures above all else. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
So, um, but yes, it, it's. Uh, I don't actually think. Well, we know we don't have a photograph of what it looked like because with a fox, you just take a photograph of a fox, but you'd have to look high and low for another two-headed cow. I, <laughs> but I assure you that if we ever find a two-headed cow, we will photograph it and put it in the map as well. <coughs> Two-faced cow, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, theatrical cow. <laughs> So even though we all think chronology is a good laugh and everything, but it, it, it's true that we still use the terms lowbrow, middlebrow, and highbrow, which which come from the, that. Is that so? Well, absolutely, and it also comes from the Neanderthal, as you well aware, not, notably very lowbrow. So I think it's slightly deeper than than that. I mean, our belief that if you've got a big forehead, you're brainy, and to an extent, of course. That might be true. I've got an enormous point. <laughs> um, but I think what we don't do is, is say that we have bumps in our head which correspond to a particular areas, particular proclivities. I think we accept, as Peter Mark Roger said, that this is bunkum, baloney, hogwash. Right, well, if you nobody else, thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you. So please remember there are books for sale, and Mr. Winchester will be happy to sign here at the front. Thanks for coming. What's that?